Rayman 2 The Great Escape is a platformer developed by Ubisoft. It originally debuted in 1999, with this Dreamcast port following a few months later in the spring of 2000. Since then, the game has been released and ported to just about every console and platform under the sun, but for this video I'll be focusing exclusively on the Dreamcast release. And what a release it was, garnering near universal critical acclaim. IGN scored the game a 9.6 out of 10, stating, Rayman 2 The Great Escape is without question the most impressive feat of game design and execution the platforming genre has ever seen. GameSpot gave the game a 9.4 out of 10, noting, Rayman 2 is one of the best platforming experiences available today. By including a wonderfully humorous story, excellent game mechanics, and perfection in almost all other categories, Ubisoft has created a game that appeals to all types of gamers. Finally, Planet Dreamcast scored the game an 8.5 out of 10, proclaiming, Rayman 2 is a beautiful, well-designed adventure that easily takes its place as one of the best 3D platformers available today. So is Rayman 2 The Great Escape still this good? Let's dive in. Rayman 2 opens with a cutscene showing two metal-mouthed pirates dragging a character named Globox past a number of cages with little creatures yelling out for help. Globox is then tossed into a cell with none other than Rayman, who announces he has lost all of his power. Thankfully, Globox regurgitates a silver lump which allows Rayman to attack through a gate and escape, with his first order of business being to rescue a character named Lee. The first gameplay type is then introduced, which is sliding. At the end of the slide, the player sees Rayman is high in the sky aboard some sort of flying ship, matching the pirate motif. Globox then crashes into him and they both fall to the ground. When Rayman wakes up, he discovers he didn't land in the same area as Globox and the adventure kicks off properly. The story segments are sprinkled throughout the game like this. Rather than lay it all out at the beginning, the goals and missions change as the adventure unfolds. So, after landing in the Wood of Light, the player can get up to speed with the controls and general flow of the game. Despite being a platformer originating on the Nintendo 64 in 1999, Rayman 2 is not a collectathon game, but rather a linear platformer much like the original title. Therefore, jumping, combat, and light puzzle solving are the three main elements to the game. In the opening stage, jumping is taught to the player in a thoughtful way. The player needs to jump back and forth on platforms over water. Failing the jump will result in Rayman landing in the water and needing to backtrack rather than die, which is nice. In the next area, Rayman needs to use a ninja-like jump to traverse vertically. At the top, Teensies are introduced. These guys act as both comic relief and guardians of sorts, allowing Rayman forward progression at the cost of collecting yellow lums. They reveal Lee is being held captive and open a portal for Rayman to enter and begin his epic journey. With the basics out of the way, the map screen is presented where the player can access each of the game's 18 levels. In level 2, the Fairy Glades, the player will learn the rest of Rayman's moveset. Rayman can swim, shoot at switches to open doors, climb vines, attack enemies, slow his descent with his helicopter hair, hit wooden blockades to bust open doors, and throw powder kegs at metal blockades. The player will also learn about all of the different lums in the game. The silver lums increase Rayman's attack power. The yellow lums are collectibles and are needed to progress through the game as the teensies have lum requirements to access new parts of the island. The purple lums are sky hooks Rayman can swing off of. The green lums are checkpoints, and the blue lums refill the air meter when underwater. Rayman 2 for the Dreamcast also introduces glob crystals, which unlock mini games not found on the previous versions of the game. Needless to say, the second level goes on for what feels like forever, or around 30 minutes for first-time playthroughs. In fact, it's this massive playtime that dissuaded me from playing this game for all of these years. I assumed every level would be 30 minutes, which is something I'm not really into. Thankfully, most levels are far more reasonable in length. 
Anyway, during level 2, the player will discover Lee is trapped by a machine. Here, the player learns to toss the powder kegs up in the air, quickly fire a normal attack, and then catch the keg so Rayman can continue forward. After repeating this process three times, breaking three metal blockades, Lee is freed. From here, more of the plot is revealed. The pirates have broken the primordial energy core into 1,000 pieces, represented by those yellow lumps. With the energy scattered about the world, Lee doesn't have the power to defeat the invading pirates. However, she reveals a spirit named Polycus is powerful enough to defeat the pirates. In order to awaken him, Rayman must find the four masks. So, with all of that out of the way, the player has a new goal. Collect the four masks, defeat the pirates, and free the massive amount of critters the pirates have enslaved. One thing Rayman does really well is slowly presenting new challenges for the player to contend with every couple of levels. In the Marshes of Awakening, for example, the player grabs onto Sam's scarf through a water skiing segment. In the Bayou, the player needs timing and precision to make it past rolling barrels. From here, the player enters one of the three gates guarded by the Teensies. If the player has enough lums, they will allow Rayman to enter the next quarter of the map. If the player hasn't been collecting yellow lums, they'll need to replay previous levels and find some more. The requirement isn't ridiculous either, and on this recorded run, I did not have any issues. The Teensies let the player move on to the Sanctuary of Water and Ice. Here, a new puzzle element is presented. There are a couple of colored bases in front of these temple doors. The player needs to find the corresponding magic spheres, carry them to the base, and then toss them on, much like inserting a key into a lock. This unlocks the first boss battle against Axel. All the player needs to do is attack the icicle above the boss, which will fall and take care of it. After this, Rayman makes his way to a pedestal, which contains the first mask. Rayman is then transported to a mysterious location and the spirit Polycus is formally introduced. After giving Polycus the first mask, Rayman is transported back to the island. Next, the walking shell is introduced. Basically, it's a missile of sorts with legs and it whinnies. From what I gather, the player needs to wear it down or tucker it out so it can be mounted like a horse. I accomplish this by running around in circles. If there is a better way to do it, I'm not aware. Anyway, the walking shell allows the player to get over new obstacles like these thorny vines. And because it is a weapon, it can be used to smash through those metal blockades on certain doors. Clever. Level 6 introduces another character to the Rayman universe, Clark. He announces he is sick and needs some life potion, which can be found back in the Cave of Bad Dreams. This is actually an alternate path in the Marshes of Awakening, where a mysterious character warps Rayman to a nightmarish place. After defeating the creature, Rayman earns the Elixir of Life and can return to the Menher Hills to aid Clark. To the best of my knowledge, this is the only time the player is forced to repeat a large portion of a level. It feels a touch out of place, but I applaud the developers for not reusing the trope to increase the length of the game. The canopy is next, and Rayman finally catches up with his friend Globox from the beginning of the adventure. After freeing him from his cell, Globox is used to get through the rest of the stage. I think Rayman 2 is playing homage to Native American culture because Globox looks like he is doing a rain dance to clear obstacles, and the mysterious Polycus has a certain unmistakable cadence. <laughs> In any case, after clearing the canopy and chasing a whale, Rayman arrives at the Sanctuary of Stone and Fire. Here, an old friend returns, the Plum. Rayman can ride the Plum and then fire his shots to act as propulsion. It works well enough, but plays as clunky as it looks, and sticks out against the smooth platforming found in the rest of the game. At the end of the Sanctuary is the second of the four masks Rayman needs to collect. Level 10, the Echoing Caves, continues the trend of new things for the player to do, like a non-linear segment where the player needs to search the level for switches, with four needing to be found to open a door. Later, the player will light the powder kegs which can then be flown around for a limited amount of time. Flying seemed to be a go-to mechanic in 6th generation platformers, and it works pretty well in Rayman 2. The keg dives and dips predictably, and navigating around obstacles is never a problem. 
Level 12, Top of the World, also introduces a new gameplay style for the player, a minecart of sorts. This works a bit like an interactive roller coaster, and the player can rotate 360 degrees around the track to avoid incoming obstacles. While not brilliant by any stretch, I do appreciate how even deep into the game's playtime, the developers were mindful with introducing new things for the player to do to keep things from feeling stale. Speaking of new things for the player to do to keep things from feeling stale, Lee arrives in beneath the sanctuary of rock and lava and gives Rayman the power of flight. However, like the original Rayman, this is limited to just this level and not an upgrade for the rest of the game. In this case, a big boss named Fouch knocks the flight power clean out of Rayman. What proceeds is my favorite boss fight in the game. The player is tasked with running towards the camera, avoiding the lava below, bouncing off platforms and knocking down a stalactite into a flouch. Like the rest of the bosses in the game, it isn't the most difficult thing in the world, but the precision platforming and attack dodging makes for an engaging battle. And with that, Rayman arrives at the third mask and the quest is nearing the home stretch. One constant throughout the journey are little cutscenes with the main villain, Razorbeard, as he learns Rayman is collecting the masks. With each mask, he becomes a little more agitated and ups his game to try and stop the limbless protagonist. This includes hijacking Clark and turning him against Rayman in a clever boss fight. The player needs to press three buttons to engage a laser and then lure Clark across it so he falls. Once he goes down, Rayman can then attack. Thankfully, upon victory, Clark is freed from this mechanical trickery and the two remain friends. Rayman also runs into Uglet, Globox's wife. She informs Rayman her children have been captured and forced to work in the mines. Thankfully, an enemy ship is nearby and the player is tasked with commandeering the ship to four different ports to rescue them. This also leads to the discovery of the fourth and final mask, which one of the children seems to have swallowed for some reason. With the four masks, Policus is able to maximize Rayman's power so the player is equipped to take on Razorbeard. Razorbeard is also prepping for a battle and purchases a giant mech to destroy Rayman. From here, Rayman's journey to Razorbeard tests the player's skill with a sliding section and a flying section before the two characters meet up for the finale. After freeing all of the critters and rescuing Globox, sort of, Rayman begins the first part of the final boss. In this first section, Rayman just needs to throw energy at the incoming bomb so they hit Razorbeard and his mech. Before the mech is destroyed, however, the platforms the characters are on collapse, and Rayman needs to be rescued before going splat. Thankfully, Lee seemed to have regained her strength and slows Rayman's descent as well as providing a flying shell. Next, the player needs to grab some energy, which allows four attacks. Ideally, the first two will be used on the mech's arms, causing it to fall, with the next two actually doing damage. Repeat this process a few times, and the mech will be destroyed. Razorbeard then escapes and detonates the mech, which destroys the pirate ship and kicks off the final cutscene. Lee, Clark, the Teensies, Globox, Policus, Suglet, and the Walking Shell are moping around, thinking Rayman blew up as well. But of course, Rayman is just fine. And with that, the world is saved and the credits roll. As noted earlier, Rayman 2 The Great Escape was met with critical acclaim and was even compared favorably against fifth generation icons like Mario, Crash, and Spyro. Even better, Rayman 2 was released prior to the North American PlayStation 2 launch, when the Dreamcast generally had superior ports over the Nintendo 64 and the PlayStation. For example, Rayman 2 The Great Escape runs at 480p on the Dreamcast and even supports true anamorphic widescreen, which is true terrific for a game released 18 years ago, and Ubisoft went the extra mile here, making sure the game runs at a silky smooth 60 frames per second. Now, Rayman himself and the other characters aren't always animated at 60 frames per second, but generally speaking, this is an exceptionally smooth experience. And not only is it technically sound, I also really dig the art direction. There's an almost storybook-like quality to the art, never feeling realistic, but instead somewhat whimsical 
Whimsical. This starts with the textures. While not exactly sharp and perhaps limited by the source material or the RAM of the Dreamcast console, they have a painting-like quality to them, not unlike the very first Rayman game. Therefore, the Glade of Dream setting is fitting with a dreamlike quality throughout. The architecture is also terrific. There are invading pirate ships all over the Glade of Dreams, and they all have exaggerated features and geometry. Rather than straight walls and paths, everything is pieced together with odd angles, aiding in the fantasy feel. About the only thing I don't like about the graphics are those thorny vine textures. They look extremely flat, are not well animated, and really stand out against the rest of the textures. I hope this was addressed in future versions of the game. Anyway, I did enjoy the darker tone of the world. While colorful, I wouldn't call Rayman a bright game by any stretch. It's usually dusk or dark out, and many of the areas like the swamps, pirate ships, and various caves have an Alice in Wonderland-like feel to them. And as an adult, I appreciate the darker tone and themes presented in Rayman 2. Speaking of dark themes, Rayman 2 is kind of a dark game. The premise of the plot is quite grim, with Razorbeard invading the Glade of Dreams to enslave the entire planet. Children are used for mining. Razorbeard eats a lum so it can never be recovered. Murphy has a creepy whisper voice. Clark is subjected to mind control. The world presented is pretty desperate and gives a nice sense of purpose for the player. While none of the characters are really developed in a meaningful way, the world's inhabitants are all likable enough and the player will want to save them. In addition to the smooth graphics and grim atmosphere, Rayman 2 The Great Escape is rocking a great soundtrack. What I appreciate the most is how each seems to capture the mood of the level. The water ski section of the Marshes of Awakening has a great upbeat funky sound, capturing the energy of the task. The Sanctuary of Water and Ice is the opposite, which is smooth and mellow. The Precipice has an orchestrated tune sounding like it was ripped straight out of a Disney flick, adding tension to the chaos happening on the screen. The the top of the world has a bassy techno track, which was prevalent in film at the time. The Tomb of the Ancients has a spooky sound, matching the eerie surroundings. Honestly, no matter which level I revisit, there is a wonderfully atmospheric piece feeling tailor-made for the level, and really helps put the presentation over the top. The rest of the audio is nice as well. There is no voice acting in this Dreamcast version, just some gibberish like what one would find in an N64 platformer. But the various tones do a nice enough job giving each of the world's characters a distinct personality. Sound effects are also nice, like cages yelling out for help or bats screeching towards the player. So, with all of that out of the way, we arrive back to the question asked at the beginning of the video. Is Rayman 2 The Great Escape still worthy of all that critical acclaim? Of course, nice graphics, great sound, and a ton of variety themselves don't make a game great. So, as Rayman 2 The Great Escape is a platformer, let's dive into what's most important, the controls and the levels. As expected, Rayman 2 is not perfect. There are moments in the adventure where the gameplay is decidedly average. Take level 3, for example, when the player needs to water ski around obstacles. There's nothing inherently wrong with this gameplay style, but the execution execution is weak. For starters, Rayman controls twitchily, darting from side to side, making precision movement nearly impossible. Second, the camera angle is way too low, so it's difficult to see where Rayman is in relation to said obstacles. The twitchy controls don't match the precision required to navigate the hazards, and the camera angle doesn't provide the visual information needed for the player to see the hazards. The result is a lot of trial and error, until the obstacle course is learned. Rather than skill-based gameplay. 
Another oddity are these air currents in level 2. My guess is the developers wanted the player to learn how to engage and disengage the helicopter hair by rewarding the player with yellow lums for messing about. However, this represents 3 minutes of just sort of staring at the screen without much really happening. The concept is never reused either, so it's a strange inclusion, as is the wall shimmy, which is only used twice as best as I can remember. The tutorial level already drags on as is, so teaching little used skills seems like a waste of time. Or perhaps some content was cut out of the game, which would have made these more useful. But nitpicks aside, the main downfall with Rayman is the combat. Basically, holding the left trigger will enter a sort of combat mode. Rayman will automatically face the nearest enemy and can then strafe left and right to dodge incoming attacks while also rifling off his own. The problem isn't in the execution, which is great. The problem is the combat never evolves past this. Later on, Rayman receives an upgrade so he can charge up a more powerful attack, but as enemies get stunned with even a non-charged attack, it isn't as useful as it sounds. And and throughout the entire game, this is the strategy. It feels shallow and enemy encounters are never a highlight to the level, but rather something to dread. Thankfully, combat is not the focus of Rayman 2, so while it is lackluster, it represents just a small portion of the game. And that's a good thing, because the rest of Rayman 2 is pretty awesome. First, Rayman controls great. He isn't terribly fast and moving him around the levels is intuitive and responsive. However, I feel it is the jumping controls that really set this game above the rest when it was released. Jumping from platform to platform feels terrific. The forward momentum, ascent, and descent feels excellent, allowing the player to maneuver tight platforms with ease and confidence. Not only is it programmed well, but it's also animated well. Rayman does a mid-air flip when he reaches the height of his jump, and does a little tumble when touching the ground while moving forward, both giving visual clues to to the player as to exactly where Rayman is in the arc of the jump. When combined with the little circular shadow, it creates a game which feels very smooth and accurate, like one might find in a game released much later. The other great thing is the moveset. Rayman is basically a two-button game. The player can jump and shoot, and besides holding the left trigger to strafe, that's it. The helicopter is activated and deactivated with the jump button. Throwing objects is handled with the attack. Climbing is automatic. The simple control layout makes the game extremely accessible, and I never found myself pressing the wrong button, like I have in more complicated games. One thing worth noting about the controls is how the camera is handled. As the Dreamcast controller doesn't have shoulder buttons or a second analog stick, rotating the camera is handled with two of the face buttons. At first, I thought this would be awkward, but it ends up working really well. Speaking of camera, it isn't always the best. During many of the tighter corridors, it seems to lag a bit, never quite giving the player a view of what's ahead. And since the game is old, the camera cannot penetrate walls. I wish the programmers had either developed a more dynamic camera in these parts or just not made so many narrow paths. But again, it's a minor nitpick in the grand scheme of things. It never caused me to die, for example, or fall into a trap. And and at times, it is scripted really well, giving visual cues to the player. However, where Rayman 2 The Great Escape really excels is with the level design and level progression. The game does an amazing job teaching the player basic concepts and then expanding upon them as the adventure unfolds. Take the opening sequence, for example, where Rayman slides down a chute and escapes the pirate ship. This sliding concept is reused throughout the game, but is made more and more challenging. In the Cave of Bad dreams, the player will need to break crystals to keep moving forward. In the sanctuary of stone and fire, the player will need to actively slow down to navigate tight turns. And in the prison ship, the player will need to activate switches to open up a path forward quickly or perish. The sliding itself isn't particularly great, but the way it's made more challenging with each iteration is pretty rad. <laughs> 
Another great example is in Level 2. The player needs to throw barrels at the machine holding Lee captive. However, bombs come hurling at Rayman, so the player needs to throw the barrel up, attack, and then catch the barrel. A simple enough pattern most gamers should be able to learn. The same technique is then required in the Sanctuary of Stone and Fire. As noted, the player can maneuver on the plums by attacking. However, Rayman cannot attack when holding things. Therefore, the player needs to toss the object up, attack, and then catch the object to move along. Bridges collapse in the bayou, letting the player know these rickety old docks won't always hold, especially when pirate ships are shooting cannon fire at them. This concept is then turned into an entire level in the precipice. Even a simple concept like attacking the blockades to break them is first introduced in a very obvious way. There is literally nowhere else for the player to go. But later on, when it again appears there is no path forward, the player will notice a familiar looking target, which knocks down a tree, allowing forward progress. I also dig how the game teaches the player Rayman's attack can ricochet off hard surfaces. But backing up a bit, I should note how the end of each level works. Scattered throughout the world are cages, 80 in all. Destroying enough of these will slowly expand Rayman's health bar. However, the last one in each stage is required to unlock the exit. Destroying the final cage will free a teensy who opens up the exit portal. In the Sanctuary of Rock and Lava, the scripted camera shows a cage high in the air, and the end plate is at a 45 degree angle. Put two and two together and the player should learn to ricochet their shot off the plate to hit the cage in the air. But even better is the realization this technique can be used for attacking enemies. While most of the enemies in the game are defeated by strafing and firing attacks, sometimes enemies are placed in a way in which the player can stand safely back and attack out of harm's way if they pay attention to their surroundings. From here, the player should be able to solve the puzzle at the end of Beneath the Sanctuary of Rock and Lava, which works in a similar fashion. The early water segments have plenty of blue lums to replenish oxygen, but later Rayman needs to race to air bubbles before piranhas get to them first. The temple puzzles become more complex, with Rayman first needing to simply walk the spheres to the appropriate temple, and later needing to use throwing mechanics to move spheres from platform to platform. It's all really well done, and it's obvious a lot of attention and care went into each and every level. Finally, using all of the skills the game teaches is then useful on repeat playthroughs. On my recorded run, for example, I noticed plenty of alternate routes leading to yellow lums and cages that I was completely oblivious to on my first playthrough, helping to keep my enjoyment and engagement high. Little things like bouncing off this mushroom in the fairy glade are utilized later on to bounce up a tree to reach a hidden cage. The walking shell is utilized to reach a secret area in Whale Bay, and at some point in the future, I'll likely attempt a completionist run, because there is still plenty of secrets hiding in the game I have yet to discover, and it's in this regard where the brilliance of Rayman 2 The Great Escape really starts to shine through. It's a ridiculously playable game. Not only are the controls excellent and the levels fun, but the game is lacking in anything frustrating. I was actually somewhat hesitant to even bother with this game after Rayman 1. The first game is filled with trial and error, poor enemy placement, and a punishing difficulty. The only way to even play the game is with the extra life cheat code, and even then, the player needs to locate all 102 electune cages, often in extremely cryptic locations, just to unlock the final level. And it's a real pain in the ass, and the game is a real grind to sit down and play. However, it seems the developers learned their lessons, and Rayman 2 contains virtually none of the nonsense from the first game. Checkpoints are plentiful, allowing the player to retry tricky sections almost immediately, and because most of the levels are of reasonable length, the punishment for a game over is never severe. Now, some will say this makes Rayman 2 The Great Escape too easy, however, I'm not sure difficulty really affects the quality of a title. Personal preferences aside, games can feature great design and be fairly pain-free, and games can be well-designed but brutally difficult. Rayman definitely falls into the former category. Any challenges the game does have are easily overcome because the proper techniques have been taught to the player, and then refined with each passing level. The levels are thoughtfully designed with Rayman's limitations in mind, meaning no pixel-perfect precision is required during jumping or attacking segments. 
the player will want to replay through the levels because they are fun or they'll want to find more secrets, not because they are dying over and over again thanks to cheap gimmicks or padding. So yeah, Rayman 2 The Great Escape is definitely still worth the praise it received. While it may have been knocked down off its throne over the ensuing years thanks to 3D platformers entering the golden age during the sixth generation of gaming, it still holds up remarkably well in 2018. Load times are reasonable, the storybook art style and warm color palette are appealing, the smooth frame rate and widescreen support are welcome additions, and the soundtrack is excellent. While I wish the story was a bit more fleshed out, as it still isn't clear to me if the Glade of Dreams is a level or the name of the whole planet, or how Globox and Rayman became separated after falling from the same point in the sky, or why Razorbeard is allowed to seemingly escape. Perhaps some of these issues are addressed in other medium, I can't be certain, but I will tell you the story isn't what kept me glued to the screen, that's for sure. At the end of the day, Rayman 2 The Great Escape gets it right where it counts the most, the gameplay. I seriously cannot understate how smooth, responsive, and intuitive the controls here are. This makes the simple act of navigating the levels a joy, and maneuvering Rayman through the whimsical land of mystique and pirates rarely feels clumsy or frustrating. As demonstrated in the first half of the video, the levels are varied, with just enough gimmicks from level to level to keep things from getting repetitive or boring. While the standard platforming environments like jungle, ocean, fire, and ice are present and accounted for, the strange creatures Rayman befriends and the overall pirate aesthetic keeps the game feeling fresh and different rather than redundant. The difficulty curve is excellent, with the beginning of the game being easy and the final couple of levels really testing the player's command of the controls and the reflexes. The level design is superb, introducing new elements in a logical way before testing testing the player later on. It's something the first game really failed at and becomes even more obvious when playing the sequel. While I can't say for certain which version of Rayman 2 is the best, I can say with confidence this is easily one of the best games available on the Sega Dreamcast, a terrific platformer in its own right, and a game I can recommend to gamers at large. While it may not be the king of platformers anymore, Rayman 2 The Great Escape is still an excellent adventure filled to the brim with charm and still represents a high point in 3D platforming.